Hi. Quickly, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Williams, David, Kelly, and Dr. Perdue for a really excellent overview. Um, and just as a reminder, so every, yep, everybody's back online. Thank you. So now it's time for questions from the audience. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and put your questions in the chat box. But in the meantime, we did have several questions that came through earlier when you guys were registering. So I'll get started. The first question is for Dr. Williams. And the question is, are there emerging practices to get more pedagogical content knowledge to rural science teachers? Heidi, we can't hear you. Sorry. No, thank you. Uh, the pedagogical content knowledge, PCK, that they have uh, found for science and STEM actually transcend urban to rural. I think what we really need to think about is what would be most advantageous in the rural uh, communities and focusing on providing those educators with specific training on how to uh, teach and operate in that environment. And that's where we're having the biggest need right now. Excellent. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that as well? Again, this is asking about practices for getting more pedagogical content uh, knowledge to rural science teachers. Okay, so the next question that we had is what have you found to be effective partnership models between higher education and P-12 districts related to STEM education? This is David from Battelle. Um, the most effective models I'm sure this sounds trite, but when you have both the K-12 teachers and the higher ed teachers sitting at the same table, that's a, a great start. But we're seeing a lot of summer bridge programs and a lot of first year, second year students at maybe in grades 11 or even 10th grade experiencing their college, uh, taking their first college experience as a cohort. There's a trend in Ohio, I think it's everywhere, uh, for adjunct professors to be to be involved in the STEM schools or coming to the STEM schools. From our point of view, the more you can get the kids into the school and in, on the college campus, the more pure of an experience it is, in, ensuring that the kids are absolutely successful at the, the post-secondary level. Uh, I think one, I, I will say this as a father, one of the worst things that you can do to a 10th grade student or 11th grade student is send them over to college so they can fail a class. That no support systems are most successful are the those bridges that we build to the post-secondary institutions that have multiple supports already built within coming both from the, the post-secondary and the K-12 world. Can I weigh in on that too? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of uh, building forward from what David shared I do want to say that um, what I'm finding out for our region is that the Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology, so the certification programs, as well as the community colleges, are, are definitely a big piece of, of what um, we are seeing students and families being able to latch onto in terms of career awareness. And, and so that partnership of, of post-secondary, and I like that phrase that David used, it has to be all of those uh, post-secondary options. And, and those advanced um, placement students that we're usually thinking about when we face them um, doesn't have to be that. It can be work-based learning for a student who is taking uh, mechatronics and is gonna be earning a certification degree uh, from a, a, an applied program. They can be having an early learning experience too, a, a work-based learning opportunity. So I think that it's that, it's that full spectrum. Um, and, and opening up the, the college ready to be the, the phrase career when college ready. So the effective partnership models are out there. Um, Pathways to Prosperity is one of them about how to engage across the full uh, spectrum of, of what supports our youth for, for the future. Thank you. 
So we have an additional question, I think, that sort of gets into what Dr. Pardue was talking about, and that specifically, how do you connect our remote rural students with STEM industry professionals and opportunities that may or may not exist in the, the community? Right. So one of the one of the ways I think we have to get incredibly creative is is the use of of um, um, well exactly what we're doing here. So thinking about dynamic ways to use a webinar connection between a, a working professional who doesn't have the time to get in the car and drive two hours to visit with a class. We want that human interaction, but how can we accomplish it using technology? So we've actually been exploring some ideas about. Um, sending out webcams to, to working professionals and saying, can you get permission to wear this for the day and take us on a walk about your plant? Um, so because again, people who live in rural areas will get in a car and drive an hour, hour and a half to a job uh, and then come back home because they love where they live. And so we need to be able to kind of think creatively as educators, how do we open up that, uh, that technology window and, and really invite um, the, the idea of, of what jobs look like today into the classroom. And I'll just um, add on to what Sally said. I, one of the things that we've seen, so I also do a lot of work um, with our computer science um, across the state. One of our schools has a iPad that they've mounted on and they have a, I, I forget the name of it, but it's their, it's their school robot. And so they will send an educator with their school robot to go do a virtual tour, or to go do a tour of a different industry partner and so the kids will be able to get to experience it through the eyes of their robot um, and, and and see the different ins and outs the other thing that i would encourage that that we've also heard is that sometimes there's a, a little bit of fear around things like computer science and oh does that mean that my kid's going to to move across the country and not stay here um, and so i think also being creative and in, in finding different um, industries that are in those rural environments that you can um, share how they use computer science as well. Um, that way you're also saying that there are opportunities here um, in our community to, to really use and apply STEM, careers available to you here. You don't feel that brain drain as well. Right, I would uh, support that as well. You really need to look at the community environment and there are STEM careers and opportunities there and some of them may not be exactly in the community. If you have some that are remote or very remote, they can Skype. And one of the best ways to get them is to have a mentor Skype in while they're doing a project or a problem-based uh, addressing a challenge. And so they're actually getting a relationship and seeing that this is possible. They develop that STEM identity which is so critical for them to even consider before they jump into it, into the uh, college environment. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump in again. This is Kelly's, Heidi, you made me think of a, another example. We um, had a design challenge. It was a, a, a elementary STEM school in Florida where they were designing a local solution to the, to the lion fish. Um, challenge in the in the waters there and so they skyped with an expert to help get them some uh, to to talk about some of their solutions and get feedback so I think like when you're thinking about those different design challenges and and real problems to the community who are the experts that you could maybe um, Skype in with even if they aren't in the community the problem itself might be something that's facing the community thank you those are really excellent suggestions okay so we have a series of questions that are asking about funding for these types of initiatives. Um, and so they sort of move from, besides IES, what are some other options for funding um, as, as people on the call try to think about expanding the opportunities in their own communities? This is David, I'll start, but I'm sure Dr. Pardue will jump in. Uh, you know, <laughs> We're all in the same boat. We're, we all chase after dollars. And, and from Battelle's viewpoint, and this is mostly through the STEMX notion where there's 21 states, everybody's asking the same question. Our response is if you have something that's actually very engaging, empowering for rural students, this is probably the best time to seek funding that I've ever seen. 
Places like NSF have seen that there is a, a real need here and that they are pushing a lot of STEM funding specifically around the rural environment. The, the big players in the game are the technology places. Look at Facebook, look at Apple, uh, even look at Google. The, it's, it's not like they're handing out money. I, I would suggest from both Battelle's viewpoint, which is we go after money and we give out money uh, in that notion, the more compelling of a, a solution that you may propose, the, the better for you. Uh, so I, I don't want to ever push that it's because of a lack of money we can't do these things. We honestly believe, and it's not being uh, with our heads in the sand, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so I'll drop away for Sally there. So, so funding, the funding I often find is it's not always dollars. It's really just the time sometimes that we need from people. So if we think about um, the fact that, and I have this conversation almost daily with some of my, my friends at, at, at the university and, and in the community, we, many of us already have jobs. And so it's sometimes it's not, it's not doing more beyond the job that we have. It's thinking about how we want to do our job differently. And, and so when we talk about, um, equipping teachers with techniques that they can use in the classroom if we will so there's this uh, from the world of engineering and the world of business there's this thing called the quality triangle so if you imagine three sides of the quality triangle one being uh, the funding uh, the money that's allocated to a project the other being the time and the other being the quality to commitment of, or the commitment to quality so you've got quality on one side you've got dollar resources and then you've got people time and, and so when you think about, we all want high quality. Um, we, we know high quality often has a, a cost, a real dollar cost to it. Um, and so we, we often want it very quickly. And so I think the, the reality that comes in on any funding cycle is, is when you start thinking about how do you really fund both from the people, time, and the money. Um, we're not gonna compromise on quality. We want great quality. So we're probably going to have to admit that it's gonna take time. And, and understanding what it means to kind of change a practice, change a community, build a community. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do constantly from day one, when we think about funding, is, is to think about a big blueprint. Everything that you wanna to try to do, you're never gonna get it all funded at once. So which piece of it can you work? What's the pivotal point? Um, if you're building a house, should it be the kitchen you build first or the bedroom? Um, you know, so thinking about what is the most at core value, um, thinking about the, the companies that we want to engage. Um, so companies often have a philanthropic uh, funding mechanism that is tied to the local community. Every community has a Walmart. I mean, that's one of the great success stories of the United States of America, right, is our ability to, 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 to leverage access to goods. And so how does Walmart play in? What are the, what are the classroom level initiatives that a teacher working against a master blueprint with their principal in that school system with the approval of the director of schools could say, this year I wanna learn how to do just this one thing, but it's a part of the big picture. So $500 is enough. It doesn't have to be $500,000. So learning how to